we've uh, fostered 29 kids. We've had 29 kids in our home, sometimes as many as five children under the age of four. So I have kind of, uh, I guess, an insider view of, you know, the foster care system dealing with the state, you know, some, how the government and the state have has basically failed kids. Because if you look at the uh, incarceration rate and inmates within the U.S., uh, you know, penal system, around i believe 70 percent of them have been in the foster care system at one point or another so clearly um, they haven't either had a good experience or the situation they went back to impacted them you know negatively like you know they came out of a situation that was yeah. uh, traumatic so you know i've seen a lot within the last four or five years and have seen a lot of kids some of which are toddlers that have experienced more things than adult, more most adults will in their you know lives. Hello and welcome to Along the Way Life's Journey. I'm your host, Carl Buccioletto. I've traveled many, many miles, met many, many people. And today we're going to talk to you with a person who I think is going to be very interesting to you. He is a podcast host, a renowned podcast host. He is a marketing specialist and a digital marketing guru. And he's originally from the Ukraine. So we're going to chat a little bit with him. Welcome to the show, Roman. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Very welcome. So as I said in the introduction, you are a podcast host and you've done many, 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 and you have a huge following. And uh, I'm just a novice at this. I've only been in it for a little over a year. I only have uh, 80 shows under my belt, but uh, perhaps you can teach me along the way as we go. <laughs> so sure. tell me. Tell me what what, you, what your specialty is in marketing, and specifically in digital marketing. Initially, I was a criminal justice major. I interned with the Secret Service on the counterfeit currency squad, and I kind of got into digital marketing as a result of the 2008 recession. So state, local, federal agencies froze hiring. Basically, I got an opportunity to have a conversation with someone at the gym. They said, come out to my car. I want to give you something that may help. And I said, kind of, why not? Took the chance. They opened their trunk, handed me a packet about search engine optimization. They said, read this packet, take another year, uh, a month or two, and can start doing it for my business. And that kind of got my foot in the door and I ran with it. I mean, it's an ever changing field. So at this point, 15 years of experience in it, I founded an agency in 2012. Uh, held several director roles on the agency side, worked with a bunch of Fortune 500 clients at this point, probably between seven and 800 clients within my career, managed teams. And that was just all from, you know, willing to take a chance. It's a lot capsulized in that much time. Yeah, but I'm sure you could write books and books of the experiences of, of what's contained inside of that. So. How do you like doing podcasts as opposed to being into the the agency side and the government side? It gives you a certain freedom, I'm sure, that you didn't have before. Yeah, I mean, I started, if I if I started when I wanted to, it would probably be a few years prior. Uh, I was always kind of, I guess, intimidated with like the, the, the back end of it, you know, where to host it, the technology, yeah. promoting it, so on and so forth, which obviously takes a lot of time. And then I said kind of, let me start and it was you know a solo show at first which morphed into a uh, interview based show and then i co-hosted shows produced a show spoken at uh you know industry podcast industry uh, conferences at this point and at this point hosting and guesting coming up on probably like 600 episodes combined so i mean i i like it it's a great chance to naturally and organically network with people and really have intimate conversations because, you know, if you meet someone in public or a networking event, it's just like, you know, somewhat superficial, uh, you yeah. know, what, what's your name? What do you do? And yeah. a lot of the time uh, I jump into and dive into right away into really heavy, you know, conversations within like the first half hour of speaking to someone. So it's a great opportunity for intimate conversation and really connect with audiences and obviously have a have a great conversation. Yeah. And I know that uh, even with the few shows that I've done, I've had some guests that suddenly, you know, you're in a conversation and they have that deer in the headlight look. And, you know, oh, the show is taking an immediate turn. I'm going to have to pick up the ball and run with it because they're either frozen or they have nothing left to say. And sometimes that happens, you know. Uh, but uh, you are a wealth of information about things of this kind. In addition to your 
business that you run and your podcast that you run. I know from the information I've received on you that uh, you're originally from the Ukraine, as I said. How long have you been here in the United States? I came over with uh, six other family members in 1990, so I was um, only five years old. Ukraine was still under the Soviet Union, so we went through Vienna, Austria, Rome, Italy, and obviously the transition was a little easier for me because I went right into kindergarten to learn a language, that kind of thing. So I've been here most of my life. I've been back to Ukraine uh, a few times. I have actually five family members currently in the Ukrainian military you know, fighting in the uh, the war in Ukraine and, you know, family impacted that way. But, you know, I've been in the U.S. for, you know, majority of my life at sure. this point. Sure. You assimilated quickly as a child. You became an American very quickly. And uh, I'm sure even though you have, you know, an affinity, an affinity for the Ukraine because of where your history is and your family's from, you're American first and foremost. But give it, what's your opinion about what's going on over there right now? I mean, it's one of those things that there's been, uh, it's been the situation be before even this. I mean, Russia, uh, you can look at historically in terms of aggression towards its neighbors. So, you know, Finland, the Baltic yeah. states, so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, under Soviet Union, the the countless, you know, Ukrainians that have been impacted, there was a artificial famine, basically a, a genocide of the Ukrainian yeah, people the song, in the 19th. Yeah, the whole the more, you know, it, the the number isn't even like concretely known, but between four and eight million around the estimate is yeah. Ukrainians perished in it. So there's been a, a history of kind of genocide, murder and other crimes to kind of eradicate Ukraine and Ukrainian culture and language. So, yeah. And I think they, you know, they made it very clear when they took the Crimea that uh, they weren't going to be satisfied without coming back and taking the entire situation. But you know, sometimes I don't want to get into politics. I don't know what your politics are, pro, right, left, right. You know, I know what mine are, and sometimes I shoot off my mouth too much about it. But I, you know, I, I'm, I'm an Italian from Brooklyn, and you know what that means. When we see something that we don't like, we speak out against it. And uh, I just think that this government has been failing us left and right, right down the line, right down to the, the tragedy that's happening down in the border right now and what they've done in the Ukraine and Afghanistan that was rural just been a terrible situation but beyond that you also uh, you're now living in Trenton New Jersey and I know I know and uh, uh, I'm, you have a family there I'm sure wife and children yep so uh well we actually just this past March adopted our son uh, out of the foster care system we had him since he was two weeks of age uh since 2018 since June 1st of 2018 we've uh, foster 29 kids we've had 29 kids in our home sometimes as many as five children under the age of four so i have kind of uh i guess a insider view of you know the foster care system dealing with the state you know some yeah. how the government and the state have has basically failed kids because if you look at the uh incarceration rate and inmates within the u.s uh you know penal system around i believe 70 percent of them have been in the foster care system at one point or another so clearly um, they haven't either had a good experience or the situation they went back to impacted them you know negatively like you know they came out of a situation that was yeah uh traumatic so you know i've seen a lot within the last four or five years and have seen a lot of kids some of which are toddlers that have experienced more things than adult, more most adults will in their you know lives. Well, I applaud you for that. I have uh, close relatives. My my goddaughter, as a matter of fact, my niece is uh, a remarkable woman as well. She has ten children. She started off with foster children. She began adopting them, and she has a mixture of of natural and adopted and foster children in her home right now at any given time. Uh, of uh, every age and every race and every you know gender and she's just remarkable and I, I really applaud what it takes to do something like that because anyone can love your natural child anyone sometimes they're difficult I have four and I know they get they can be very difficult to love sometimes but it takes a special person to find a love in their heart for a foster child or an adoptive child because and to make them their own very, I applaud you for that. I really do. So, uh, you you came you from the Ukraine originally. You're a foster uh, parent. 
tell us a little bit something about, I know that you're a believer. Tell us a little bit about your, your faith walk and how you got here. Yeah. So like that, that's part of kind of my journey to the U S. So, uh, we came over technically as uh, religious refugees, I guess, categorized because my family, I was brought up in a Christian home. So they went and worshiped and, you know, believed in God and Jesus Christ as their Lord and savior. They even went to church during communism. So under communism, you know, they don't let you worship whoever you worship. Um, basically you have to kind of like serve the state per se same thing now in china obviously religious persecution uh you know crackdown on christians stuff like that so when the opportunity arose we had somebody sp a sponsor distant family member here and we were able to come over as uh, religious refugees came over here and you know went to a, a ukrainian church which is easier for my parents grandparents and aunt because obviously they didn't speak any english so kind of like being welcomed into a church that was Ukrainian speaking, it, it, it helped. Um, at this point, I would I would consider myself non-denominational. So about like for me, it's you know having a personal relationship with God. So like you know, religion doesn't save. Having a personal relationship with Absolutely. God, accepting Him as your Lord and Savior, and you know, continuing that walk. So I've been trying. Obviously, it's a it's a daily uh, you know thing because people struggle with things. People deal with you know hardships. Uh, loss, grief, uh, that kind of thing. But, you know, to to show, obviously, in my life in terms of mirroring, obviously, you know, Christ's walk as best as I can and help as many people as I can and, you know, share my testimony. I think that's very important because we don't realize, and I I agree with you, I have a similar background, not that I that came from another country, but I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. That means I'm was born into a Catholic family, you know what that means. And I went through all of the processes in my formative years. And then after I grew up and I began to read the Bible on my own, I came to a different understanding and recognition. And uh, my wife and I belong to Calvary Chapel, which is a non-denomination of huge consequence. And uh, we uh, we are deeply committed to our faith and to being the, trying to be an example to others, to live your life, to to teach others and, ex and express to others the salvation of Jesus Christ and what it means. You see that painting on the cardboard there behind me there, um, left to right? That's a, yep. picture of, that's a picture that my wife painted of Jesus Christ holding this, the lamb, the shepherd holding the lamb. And that picture has gone all around the world. It was in Billy Graham's magazine, and it was used for inspirational purposes in many, many places. And we use it in small format to hand out to people in, with scripts to just begin the conversation. And uh, people are hungry for it, especially now. You know, you, you mentioned that in the Soviet Union, there was oppression for religious people. Well, we're seeing more and more in the United States that there is there is the beginnings and the undertow not only of anti-Semitism, but anti-Christians as well. There's a big fight ahead of us. I think it's coming. It's been building more and more every day. You know, we saw recently that the government was told to do background checks on Christians to see if they were radical or not. I mean, how do you spell my count? You know, so <laughs> it's the kind of thing that we have to be careful of and be on guard and speak out against, I think. I think it's important for us to speak out. Yeah, I agree. And I think, uh, obviously, this uh, country was founded on, you know, religious freedom and, you know, Absolutely. people escaping religious persecution. And I feel like God's been taken out of so many, you know, contexts of life, government, that if you take something good out, it's going to be replaced by something bad. So you have different That's things becoming normalized, things of that nature, like good is bad, uh, you know, and bad is good. So it's just like upside down world. Well, people, sometimes I hear people who are so surprised about the things that are going on in the schools. And I think to myself, how could you be surprised when you took God out of the school? How could you possibly be surprised that evil would fill the void? It, it had to happen. It's inevitable. The, you know, the laws of nature hates a vacuum. When you take one thing out, as you just said, something else has to come in its place. So, but uh, we work diligently for these kinds of things. And I try to use some of the podcasts that I do as a platform to speak out against it. 
almost inevitably I get hate mail about it, but that's okay. I'm a big guy. I can take it. You know, I've lived to a ripe old age. And if they get me now, I've had all they ever used to do anyway. <laughs> so, so what's on your agenda? What are you, what are you planning or working towards at the moment? I mean, a big thing is just, you know, advocating for foster care reform, trying to share that as much as possible because, you know, me being a foster parent, I've seen a lot of holes in the foster care system, the lack of therapeutic services for kids, uh, kids being reunified too soon, ending up back, you know, in the system, uh, you know, kids treated as, you know, a case number, not a human being. Obviously, the goal of, uh, you know, foster care is reunification at some point with, with the, the family or where they were, you know, taken from. But a lot of the times from seeing it directly, uh, those problems are inherently generational. So uh, their parents, the kids' parents were in foster care, and then their grandparents were in foster care. So the mental health issues, right. the substance issues were never addressed, and you're putting a child back in that situation that that's all they've seen. You know, they're, they have a higher probability to continue that cycle, especially when most of the kids are coming from uh, you know, homes with no male role model, no father figure. A lot of them have fathers, but they don't want to see them or have anything to do with them. Then, you know, I can see how kids could turn to a, either a life of crime when they get older or be used because they're so emotionally vulnerable. Yeah. And when the child is raised without an example, or rather when they're raised with the only example, that's a poor one, a negative one. You know, I'm not one of these people that says you can't, you, you don't blame the children for everything. You know, sometimes they're responsible and they have to take their responsibilities. And that's the only way they can grow into mature adults that accept what the world is and, and to become full individuals. But very often when they don't see anything but the negative are all around them and they all, they, all they see is substance abuse and split homes and multiple partners coming and going, you know, you, the poor kids are they're they're brought into this world with two strikes against them, you know. And I I agree. I think you have to work towards not only building them towards reunion reunion with their families, but you got to work towards building that family into a a place of of security where they they have a base where the family has a chance to survive. If the child comes in, they have a better chance to survive. But the family first has to be built back together, and they're. There are lots of different groups around the country now. I, I support one here called Sheridan House that does a tremendous amount of work on the family. They take the children away. And they're into, you know, secure areas for education, for, for modeling and so forth. But then they work on, typically, it's the single mother. The father's gone. He's out of the picture. You know, it's a single mother. So they work with them and what their abuse issues are whether it's substance abuse or emotional issues, they work with them on, you know, protocols and techniques on how to get a job, how to fulfill certain role things in the life. It's amazing how few how few skills they have. They 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 don't know some of the most basic things in life, and that's why when when the slightest thing comes along, they crash. They they reach out for the drug or they reach out for another man, and so. We have a, a man who now lives in Trenton, New Jersey with a family and a lifestyle that uh, is typically American with the things that you want to do, the choices that you have available to you, and you're able to praise and worship your God publicly without pursuit against you. And uh, you speak out for, as an advocate for foster children. I think those are all remarkable things. And at the same time, you work hard in building your business and being a spokesman for your your, your industry you're, because you're a, you're, a, you're a marketing guru from what I'm told of here. So, I, you know, I had a little marketing experience 150 years ago when I was young, but uh, it's completely different than it is today. When we were marketing, uh, people did business with people they know, like, and trust. They still do that today, but they don't know how many people know who they are and what their business is. It's, you know, especially with digital marketing, there's so much data available to you. Which brings me to the next conversation. And this is one I'm sure you've been 
considering or discussing among your peers yourself? AI. What do you think of AI and what all this commotion is about it and where it's going? Because it seems to be the kind of a technology that will take on a life of its own if it isn't monitored. Yeah, I think, I mean, it it has a possibility to replace a lot of industries. So it's like, if you feel like it's something that can replace your industry, figuring out how to pivot and, you know, wherever you're in your career or how you can be that person or that expert that uses it within your field. So, I mean, I've utilized and tested things like a popular, you know, uh, AI is chat GPT. So, you know, having kind of the, the paid version of that subscription, seeing how it, you, it works and it's only as good at, well in that specific function as the prompt you give it. So you still have to give it direction. You know what I mean? So if you give it something broadly, you're not going to be satisfied with what you're looking for. But I've actually gave it things like, um, you know, creating uh, thank you letters for, you know, interviews, um, different things in terms of cover letters. And it does a decent job in terms of kind of formulating format. Some things are still a little, a little robotic or choppy. It's it's actually good when you want to learn a skill set. So you can tell it how to, you know, teach me so-and-so. This is like what I do. I need to learn more of so-and-so. So it it has potential. It's actually potential to to free up your time. So like for a digital marketer, if you have a digital marketing agency or whatever your role is, you know, maybe you're a you know analyst, specialist, director, it has the time to free up time and you can utilize and, and produce more. So if you're a content creator, you can produce more content, not to say that you just set it and forget it and it makes all right. this content for you. You still have to look, look at it. You still have to rewrite it, potentially reword it, but it has capabilities to uh, free up your time and make you more productive. And then the, Obviously, the other thing of AI going out of control, because without being like uh, monitored or any kind of safeguards in place, like a like a Terminator scenario. But there's been like, uh, you know, uh, AIs that were left to themselves. I think Facebook made one a year or two ago where there were two AIs and they started like freely learning and they created their own language and it was getting a little like scary. So they had to pull the plug on it. So you really have to monitor it. Because you don't know how fast, you know, it learns, it kind of mutates, so on and so forth. So it it has the possibility to do good. Like one one instance also this past year, chat GPT uh, diagnosed a one in 100,000 uh, illness uh, of a patient within like uh, a few seconds where it would potentially take a doctor maybe days, months, or they may have not even gotten it right. So it has possibility to impact mankind but it also has a possibility to potentially destroy it yeah i've been watching that closely also and i did notice that uh they did some experiments with uh, dna and they determined that they could track and analyze dna where it would take laboratories as much as six to eight weeks to accomplish things that could be done in five minutes and they think could uh pattern out the entire world dna with these kinds of machines but, uh, you know, as Elon Musk said, the caution is they are so rapidly engaging into self-learning that the fear is that they will create their own replication, their own machine that will surpass mankind, that will be brighter and stronger and be without the emotions that keep us in check from creating more and more holocausts in this world. Machine would never have that. It would just go to its own its own scheme, you know. So uh, those are things that have to be watched. I'm a, I'm a writer myself. I, is a book that I published last year out on my stand behind me. And I do short stories and things that I experimented a little bit, as you said, with this new product. And I gave it the, you know, the concept of 10 storylines I was thinking of working on. And within 10 minutes, I had 10 pages for each of the storylines, you know, and I thought to myself, this is not right. <laughs> You can't. You can't do this. Isn't that your work? All you did was ask a few, few brief questions. It's the thief that does this. <laughs> so I wouldn't use it. But uh, but they were good. They were good. <laughs> yeah, it's good for idea uh, development. So like you said, hey, I have these, you know, ten ideas. Refine them for me, or you know, I have this subject. Can you create like you know ten, twenty titles, or like drill down? So it's kind of good for 
um, brainstorming, if you will, and yeah. giving you ideas and potentially figuring out the direction. But you're, you know, there's people that are monetizing it by like having an AI write a children's book, then having right. another <laughs> AI illustrate it. Right. And putting it on Amazon Marketplace and Kindle right. and I'm selling self print it. Yeah. on Amazon. I, yeah. I mean, if that's not the epitome of fraud, I don't know what it is. You know, and then and then have the audacity to try and get a copyright on it. <laughs> you know? Yep. My wife is a uh, accomplished artist, a graphic artist, and she likes to do reels. So she gave it a set of questions or or subjects and pr- programmed it, and within minutes she had. A series of reels, one a day for a month, to carry through on the theme within minutes. I, you know, that would take, I have to imagine that would take somebody days and days to put together in that format. To have the image of it, the color content, the the fonts exactly right, the, the carry on a subject on subject on subject. And yet it was done in minutes. Well, that goes. Yeah, to, it, it could potentially. Absolutely- Yeah, it could potentially probably take you a day, like coming from the agency side. So like, you know, uh, a company would hire you and like I've I've worked with pharmaceutical companies, uh, financial services like KPMG. So like the agency would be tasked to create a social media calendar. So, you know, a post, two posts a day, whatever the cadence, you have to create the, the actual text copy. And then, like you said, match it or figuring out the imagery or branded imagery that would go with that post or a video clip or whatever the creative is. And usually at minimum, that would probably take, you know, uh, a, a talented or skilled uh, producer, you know, social media producer, probably eight, eight to 12 hours where yeah. like, if you now say, Hey, I need 30 days of uh, potential, you know, tweets uh, about this subject and, you know, vary it so-and-so and give it enough prompt that you can get a lot of creative stuff to fill. Like, now uh, a solopreneur or somebody looking to start something or build a personal brand has like a personal assistant in a way and a creator that they can utilize and and save time and potentially money as well yes because it is expensive you know i have a producer you i think you know him mike tichocho and uh when i first wrote my my book i said i hired a publicist and they said well you have to do some interviews so that i was interviewed by a bunch of news channels and so forth and then they said well you have to do some podcasts and mike picked me up and we did that and then after a a very short time the publicist said you know you have to have a podcast of your own you know you tell an 80 year old man he has to have a podcast he may as well tell me go recreate a dinosaur what the hell do i know about podcasts i didn't even know what it was frankly i really didn't know what it was so they introduced me to mike and he took glove in hand and he taught me how to do these things and uh, create a podcast and a format. We took the concept from my book, uh, you know, life's journey along the way, different people that you meet and experiences that you have. And that's what we try to make the, the podcast about interesting people and their stories. But I, I could have never done it on my own. Now here I'm into it about almost 80, 80 shows. It's a year and a half later. And I'm just beginning to think maybe I could start self producing this. Until I start to look into what has to be done, I said, and I'm 81 years old now. When am I, yeah. what am I, what am I trying to prove here? <laughs> yeah, if you do, I mean, uh, the benefit of obviously having a professional that knows what they're doing to save you time and, and everything else, and maybe obviously technical, it's, it's nice mm-hmm. when you just hit record, you record it, you send the audio and video, and right. then, you know, people put it where it needs to go, launch it, so on and so forth. But if you're really doing something yourself, like from start to finish, being the host and the producer and the promoter, you know, for let's say a half hour to a 45 minute recording, it could all in could be like five or six hours of work. Yeah. So yeah. It, it gets very tedious, especially when you have obviously a family and other responsibilities. But it's five or six hours when you know what you're doing. Yeah. When you're hunting pecking alone, you know, it's not five or six hours. It's extremely much more than that. And I do one show a week, you know, so I have a limited amount of hours left in my life. I got to use them right. Yep. So we're coming towards the end of our time here. And it's a short show. It's only a half hour. But uh, I appreciate your wisdom and what you've contributed. And I certainly appreciate you as an individual with all that you're doing for foster children and to and to acknowledge your walk in life. I think that's very important. 
to stand up to the world and say, this is who I am. If you have a question, ask me, I'll help you. You know, very important. So having said that, what I would say to you, is there anything that you'd like to say to anyone before we close? Yeah, I mean, like, like you said, if any anyone has a question, either about digital marketing or is looking to become a foster parent or looking to help in one way or another, I'm always happy to, you know, connect, answer any questions. A lot of the time, like even you know, point you in the right direction. If somebody, I, I'm I'm a, a proponent. If you know somebody's trying to scam you, I always try to help people out to you know save them time and money and kind of heartache in the digital marketing space. And I think regardless of what you're doing, like at the end of the day, I think for me personally, it's about you know leaving a legacy and what people right. are going to remember me by, and be more so of a a heart-led entrepreneur where right? I can help those around me to not be just one person going up in an elevator, but bring the people around me and share my knowledge and, you know, my experience along the way as well. That's great because it's not just for us. It's never just for us. You know, there's a saying that says to much, to who much is given, much is expected. We're supposed to share in this world. And I agree with that. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for joining us on this show today. I hope you learned something from it. Roman was a very, an experienced individual and his background and his experiences. And I'm, I'm sure it meant something to you. It certainly did to me. I remind you that uh, all of his information and contacts will be in the show notes. You'll know how to reach him. You'll know how to contact him and how to ask the questions he's open to you to provide to him. So we do a new show every, well, we're going to start a new schedule right now. We're going to do a new show every first Wednesday and third Wednesday of the month for a little bit because we're doing a little, construction work here at my house and I need the extra time away from the studio. Uh, and I remind you that uh, you have your own story. Everybody has a story and I know you have one and no one can tell it like you do. Write it down, share it with your family, share it with your friends, share it so the world will hear it because when it's too late, it's too late and that wisdom will be gone. Make sure the world knows what you have to say, what you have to tell. And I, Employ you. I know I'm a big blustery guy from Brooklyn and it seems unseemly for me to say this, but I tell you what I tell you every week. Love somebody today. Very important. Grab them in a big bear hug and tell them you love them because time is short. I love you today, Roman. Love you too. Take care. Thanks for having me on. God bless.